So, ladies and gentlemen, in my capacity of director, I have the pleasure and the honor to welcome you at the European Gravitational Observatory, the research infrastructure created by the French CNRS and the Italian INFN in the year 2000 to construct, upgrade, and operate the Virgo interferometer, one of the three largest experiments in the world devoted to the search and the study of gravitational wave, a challenge opened since 100 years. I thank you for having accepted the invitation to take part to one of the two press conferences that the Virgo and the LIGO, LIGO collaboration are organizing to communicate major scientific results. The simultaneous press conference is held in now in Washington, D.C., where our LIGO colleagues are gathered for the same purpose. Galileo Galilei, some 400 years ago, and a few kilometers from here, opened the scientific approach to astronomy. Today, LIGO and Virgo are opening a new window of the universe. As Fulvio Ricci, the spokesperson of the Virgo experiment, will tell you in a while. Please, Fulvio. Good evening. In uh, 1916, uh, Albert Einstein predicted uh, the existence of gravitational waves. Today, we are glad to announce uh, that we detected, for the first time, uh, gravitational waves. Okay, let's go. Uh, gravitational waves are ripples of the space-time which are propagating at the velocity of the light in the universe. And uh, then uh, they travel and uh, they are arriving uh, on the Earth. And this is the effect of the gravitational waves. It's a deformation, strain. It changes the mutual distance between two masses. Here, you will see that uh, this effect uh, is, uh, can be detected uh, using interferometers. Both uh, the two uh, movies uh, that I have shown uh, are uh, vastly exaggerated. The effect uh, is not so large as it is shown in the movie. The, contrary, the, the reality is uh, that we are dealing uh, with uh, measurements uh, which are extremely difficult we have uh, to measure displacement uh, of the test masses, uh, which are uh, 100 million times smaller than the diameter of an atom. This requires uh, special technology. This requires uh, to deploy several interferometers uh, on the Earth. Here we have uh, the two interferometers in the United States, uh, the LIGO detectors, uh, the interferometer in Germany, which, is, uh, support, which was supported by United Kingdom and Germany, GEO 600, and then Virgo, where uh, we are here today. This uh, network of detectors uh, operated uh, in combination uh, since 2007. We took data and we analyzed data and uh, we were able uh, to set uh, significant uh, upper limits on the flux of gravitational waves uh, which arrived on the Earth. Then an upgrade phase started, and uh, first of all, uh, the advanced LIGO project started. Later, started also the upgrade of Virgo, the advanced Virgo project which is uh, now uh, is, uh, in, uh, uh, we, we are planning to end this operation soon, in the next months. So, 
The LIGO upgrade, uh, the LIGO upgrade was concluded in the spring 2015, uh, and LIGO took data in stable condition uh, since September 2015. Here, the two pictures uh, are the pictures of uh, the LIGO interferometer in Hanford, uh, which is uh, 300 kilometers east uh, to Seattle, and uh, the second one is uh, the Livingston interferometer, uh, which is uh, 70 kilometers north of New Orleans in Louisiana. So, in September 14, 2015, at uh, 11, 50 minutes and 45 seconds, uh, Central European summer time, the two interferometers uh, detected in coincidence uh, this signal. What I am showing here are the two alarm signals that were detected using an online software pipeline that was conceived for detecting generic transient search. The signal to noise ratio, the ratio between the signal and the noise of the detector was relatively impressive, 24. But we started immediately to try to understand if uh, it was due to a malfunctioning of the system or uh, even was related to external disturbances. No evidence for that has been found. So we continue to take data in a rather stable condition, trying to assess the statistical significance of this event. What I'm showing here are plots of the signal. In the vertical axis, there is the frequency, the instantaneous frequency of the signal. On the horizontal axis, there is the time. Color are associated to the intensity, the amplitude of the signal. And you will see that this signal has a very special feature. This signal is a signal that in the time, is instantaneous frequency is increasing and the amplitude is increasing. Then it stops. And this permits us, the feature and the comparison with the background permits us to assess that uh, such a kind of signal cannot be associated to a random effect. In principle, we were able to evaluate the false alarm rate at the level of 1 over 200,000 years. We have to wait more than 200,000 years, at least, for having such a kind of event done just by chance. The probability associated is 2 to 10 to minus 7, and this brings us to the conclusion this, this is a 5.1 sigma effect. The standard sigma is the standard deviation. So this, extremely, this uh, uh, signal is extremely robust from statistical point of view. Then let's go deep in describing the signal. What I'm showing here on the upper part of this figure are the raw data of the signal just filtered in the bandwidth between 35 and 350 hertz. The red trace are the data from Hanford, the blue from Livingston. Above, <coughs> down, you have the general relativity waveform that can be computed and fits this data. This is a, a waveform that can be computed starting from the general relativity equation of Einstein. And if we subtract this theoretical waveform to the data, we end up with a trace which is compatible with the noise of the detector. These are the residual, and uh, these residual are compatible with the noise of the detector. Then let's go in the interpretation of the signal. 
the signal has three different characteristics. The first part is the so-called in spiral phase. What does, what does it represent? It's the phase in which you have extreme, two extremely compact objects which are spiralizing one to the respect of the other. So their velocity is increasing when they are approaching, and so also the intensity of the emission of gravitational waves increases. Then what you have here is the merger phase. The two bodies start to collide and form a unique body, the final black hole. The final black hole that relax and become a quiet object. Then let's go inside, a bit inside. From the first part of this waveform, the spiral one, we are able to extract all the information concerning the masses of the two compact objects which are forming the binary system and the distance, the luminosity distance. From the last part, the relaxation, what we are calling the ring down, we are able to extract, also to infer, the mass of the final black hole and the angular momentum, how fast this final object is rotating. Then, the last interesting plot is the plot that is in the lower part of this figure, this gives you the information concerning the relative velocity of the two objects before the merger. And uh, here there is, uh, on the horizontal axis, there is the time. On the vertical axis, there is the relative velocity expressed in fraction of the velocity of the light. And you see that the velocity is really impressive. <coughs> When the two objects collide, or better, you have to say, merge, the velocity is half of the velocity of the light. So it's a really a relativistic offer, an impressive collision of two objects. So finally, what uh, we conclude? We are facing uh, a new phenomenon, which is the collision of two black holes, with a primary black hole mass of 36 solar masses, the secondary black hole masses of 29 solar masses, the final black hole mass is 62 with a spin, that's the rotation, is of the order of 0.7, and the luminosity distance is telling us that this is a quite cosmological event because it's far from us, 1.3 billions of light years. All these details of uh, the discovery are contained in this article. This article is published today in Physical Review Letters. You are able to download it from the uh, website of Physical Review Letters. And uh, with uh, this uh, Paper. There are several other papers concerning the astrophysical implication, the parameter estimation of the system, the test on general relativity, so on and so forth. And all these companion papers can be downloaded today from the database of LIGO and Virgo, tomorrow from the general database of the preprint. So, finally. Let me conclude. We detected gravitational waves from a binary system formed by two black holes. This is a, an the results of an experimental effort which has been carried on by 1,000 physicists and engineers which are spread in four different continents. This is the end of a way which was long, an, F, an experimental effort started 50 years ago with the pioneering work of Joe Weber. But it's also a beginning. We are 
beginning to write a new chapter of fundamental physics and we are opening a window to look at the invisible universe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fulvio. The LIGO and Virgo partnership is a rare model for international cooperation in science, a necessary and winning approach for the advancement of knowledge. The strength of our collaboration is demonstrated by the presence here in Kashina of the deputy director of LIGO, Albert Lazzarini, that I would like to invite to talk. Thank you, Thank you Federico. <coughs> I'm honored to be here this afternoon to share with you the news that uh, Fulvio alluded to of the momentous discovery the LIGO detectors made on the 14th of September 2015. LIGO detected <coughs> the coalescence and merger of a pair of massive black holes, thereby giving birth to a single larger black hole. This is the first ever observation and confirmation of the existence of binary bl black hole systems in nature. A century after Einstein predicted their existence, LIGO has detected gravitational waves by their effects on space and time within our detectors here on Earth. Nature was exceedingly generous to LIGO and Virgo, providing us with a strong signal that you saw weeks after we began initial ob scientific observation with the advanced LIGO detectors. Both the LIGO scientific collaboration and the Virgo collaboration participated in this discovery and we have jointly published the results of the research. The LIGO laboratory is composed of two observatories separated by 3,000 kilometers which corresponds to a 10 millisecond light travel time. Thus, all astrophysical events that we detect must occur in coincidence between our two observatories within this very narrow window. And that is a very big discriminator against backgrounds. It's important for us to acknowledge the contribution that the geo uh, component of our collaboration in the UK and in Germany made to uh, both intellectually and materially to uh, the advanced LIGO interferometers. The United Kingdom contributed an exquisitely designed set of suspensions that make the frequency, low frequency performance of, uh, possible with our interferometers. Germany contributed a single frequency, single mode, high power laser that is used to sense the motion of our mirrors caused by the passing gravitational waves. UK and German scientists also contributed to algorithms and computational resources to make the data analysis possible. LIGO has allowed us to hear the death spiral of two massive black holes as they collide and merge, as Fulvio described. And we have heard this through the effect of the passing gravitational waves interacting with, within our detectors by their perturbation of space and time. From the details of the signal that we detected, LIGO and Virgo were able to determine that the masses of the individual black holes were 36 and 29 solar masses. We see here an animation of the event using a mathematical relativistic model based on the data that LIGO acquired. It depicts the final moments of black hole pair as they merge and create a more massive black hole. The model is superimposed on a star field to allow us to see the black holes as shadows. The orbiting black holes churn and distort local space time and this causes the distant stars behind the black holes to a uh, gravitational lens, which is the effects that you see here. The gravitational waves themselves are too weak to be noticeable in this particular animation. It's interesting to remember that during the last instant, these two massive bodies were moving at almost one half the speed of light, and their combined masses of more than 60 suns 
could fit into a region of about 400 kilometers, which is the distance from Genoa to Rome. LIGO's first detection is characterized by many superlatives. The two, solar, uh, the two objects that merged had 36 and 29 solar masses, and yet the final mass was 62 solar masses. Three solar masses were converted into radiant gravitational waves according to Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. In fact, in the last fraction of a second, the pair of black holes were radiating gravitational wave energy at a rate that corresponds to the brightness of 100 billion trillion suns. For a final second before um, the merger occurred, this event was estimated to be 50 times brighter than the entire visible luminous universe but in gravitational waves rather than in electromagnetic waves. Yet, the effect that LIGO detected was unimaginably tiny. Einstein himself thought gravitational waves would never be observed because they are so weak. The four kilometer distance between our mirrors moved by four one thousandths the diameter of a proton. In meters, that's a four preceded by 17 zeros. By analogy, the precision with which this measurement was made corresponds to measuring the distance to our nearest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri, to less than the thickness of a human hair. And yet, our event um, had a difference of time of arrival between the two sites of seven milliseconds, which allowed the two interferometers, uh, the data to infer that the location of this source was somewhere in the southern sky but with an uncertainty that was a, a corresponds to a broad arc, as you see in the inset. To do better requires a global network of similar detectors. And for this reason, we eagerly await the Virgo interferometer here in Kashina to join LIGO later this year for our second joint observing run. Virgo's contribution to our ability to better localize these sources will be critical and important. LIGO and Virgo interferometers are able to measure, as you saw from the signals, amplitude and phase of the gravitational waves. And so a global network can operate as a single phased antenna array that can detect and localize more of these types of sources. Accurate localization will enable LIGO and Virgo to team up with conventional astronomical observatories to, look, to seek um, optical counterparts to what we see in the gravitational wave window. LIGO and Virgo <coughs> began their journey to discovery in 1997 when we agreed to join our efforts in a common data format to ensure that we could mutually analyze each um, collaboration's analysis, uh, data for analysis. This, common, this commonality was motivated by the realization two decades ago that the best possible gravitational wave science requires a global coherent network of similar detectors. So over the four centuries since Galileo first pointed a telescope to the wonders of the heavens, astronomers have succeeded in piecing together a rich mosaic of our universe using electromagnetic waves, from the highest energy gamma rays to radio waves. We are now discovering the wonders of the cosmos using a new kind of instrument to detect the tiny ripples of space and time here on Earth as gravitational waves from distant events pass through our planet. LIGO and Virgo today announced that we are starting to fill in the gravitational wave sky with our first observation. This discovery ushers in a new era, a new branch of astrono observ observational astronomy in, that uses nature's weakest force to probe the innermost workings of compact stellar systems composed of neutron stars and black holes. And LIGO and Virgo invite you to stay tuned for more discoveries to come. Thank you. As for the last scientific uh, talk uh, of the first part of this press conference, uh, I would like to invite Catherine Riemann from the Observatoire de Nice to talk also on behalf uh, of Alain Brillier, uh, to which we send our best wishes, and Adalberto Giazzotto, who is sitting at the end of the table. These are the two fathers of the Virgo experiment. And uh, Riemann 
we talk about uh, the early phases of this uh, extraordinary and complex adventure. Please, Ned. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, going to tell you briefly the story of Virgo. The story of Virgo, be, sorry, before the construction, and mostly the story of people who made it possible. Uh, actually, the story started more than 35 years ago in France and in Italy. Uh, Alain Brier, in France, Actually, I will start with France story because I know it better. Alain Brier was first, first met Peter Bender in the US, in Gila, Colorado, when he was in postdoc with Jane Hall. And he met Peter Bender, and he got so excited by knowing that there is possibility to detect gravitational wave la with laser interferometry. And after that, he turn on and keep going, talking with people on that field. So he met the people in Garching, in Glasgow, and after that he met Ray Weiss in MIT. At the bottom you see pictures of our small team at that time with these two MIT students. If you know them, they are now high-level people in LIGO. <laughs> uh, so why gravitational wave interested us? We thought at this time, in France actually, that we will be, uh, it will be a good challenge for us to try to detect this gravitational wave because we had uh, a lot of expertise in stable lasers, in precise measurement in, in, in optical metrology. And it was a new field for us, it was risky, but it was so exciting. And uh, to find some money to work, to start working on R&D, we had a lot of talk with people in France, in many labs, to try to convince them to come with us, to try to convince them it is good. But sometimes we had a lot of laughs back. They always say, you are crazy. You want to measure a hair thickness in a distance from the Earth to the Sun. It's crazy. Anyway, we got some money to make some tabletop experiment in Orsay. And meanwhile, the collaboration with Europeans have started too. And we had a lot of meetings, discussions, scientific talks together, meetings here in France, in, in Germany, in Glasgow, etc. And But we realized that in that mid-80s, it was really too early to have a European kilometric project. But things change. The turning point was when, in 1985, Alain Brier met Adalberto Giazzotto. And Adalberto Giazzotto, who was coming from the high energy physics field and has been at that time already working for many years on seismic isolation, likely for bars. Because he had the intuition that there will be many more sources to be observed in the low frequency range. So those two people talked together, and they found that there will be, they have complementary expertise if they go on that detection of gravitational wave field with laser interferometry. So uh, after a few years of working and collaboration together, no. uh, the green proposal came out that we submitted to uh, INFN and CNRS in 1989. So it was the Virgo project. And the Virgo project had some specificity. I should say some originality relative compared to the previous kilometric one in US and Europe. Because besides the fact that we will not make any prototype, we go directly to the kilometric range. Besides the fact that the, we will use infrared lasers instead of green lasers, the biggest original point is that we will use low frequency detection. Thanks to the high level seismic isolation that Adalberto has worked on for these, those years. 
So the green proposal, and I would like to point out that on the last page of this green proposal, this is the, the picture in the middle, there are already names for people in Europe and US for coordination of, you didn't know that, <laughs> coordination of subsystem. So on the, on the, on the right, probably the, the same. So Virgo was born in 1992 when the French minister and INFN approved the project, each other more or less independently. And the, so that's the picture of after the approval of our one of our meeting, approval approved the approval. You see pe people are all smiling and very happy. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the only thing that I would have noticed is that at this time we didn't know that it would be a challenge as far as human behavior is concerned because it is very difficult to have people working on the same project. I, I, I put the same boat because it is difficult to find a compromise between when stopping R&D and making the construction and when doing still some R&D to have better performances. But anyway, thanks to the enthusiasm, perseverance, and tenacity of all the Virgo people and Ego people, we are now in, have now a very good project. And the last point is that I show the pictures of people talking together around a uh, table. And uh, a mention to Jean-Marie Makowski, the father of the LIGO and Virgo mirrors, standing near Gary Sanders from LIGO and Angelo Scribado, the first ego director. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nari. Now I have the pleasure to invite the representative of the institution. A few of them supported Virgo and Dego since the beginning. Others uh, joined when we started the Advanced Virgo project, uh, always given a continuous a strong support to our uh, uh, activity. They, they believed in the visionary ideas of, of the scientists. I would like to invite for friends uh, uh, the CNRS, uh, uh, represented by the director of uh, IND Petrois, Reynald Pen. Yes. Okay. okay um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Federico, for uh, allowing me to, give, uh, to say a few words on behalf of CNRS. Um, the president of CNRS, Alain Fuchs, could not be with us today, but I can tell you that he's also a very great supporter of this uh, science, of this project. So. Um, and I'm here to convey his warm congratulations to uh, the people of LIGO and Virgo uh, for what they achieved today. So we've heard it many times already, several times already, let's say. This day is indeed historic. Not only have we now di directly detected gravitational wave from an event that happened very, very far away, about 500 mega per sec away, so that's very far. It's about a thousand times, uh, you know, the size of our galaxy. Uh, but also which happened 1.3 billion years ago. So that's also a big number. Those, you know, everything is big in this, in this project. So furthermore, this event happens to be the result of the merging of two massive black holes. So black holes, massive, about 30 times more massive than our sun. So this is again a very big number. This project is about, you know, uh, big numbers. Except for the signal itself. The signal we've heard is very, very weak, very, very small. What is measured is a tiny change of distance, which I have a different comparison from the previous speakers. I tell you mine. If you compare it between, to the distance between Earth and the Sun, this is about the size of one atom. So one atom difference in 150 million kilometers. That's not much, that's very small. Now, this discovery is a result of about 25-year, uh, you know, 25-year-long scientific effort, doubled, if I may say so, with a tremendous technical achievements. So, 25, 25 years is a big number as well. So, so, as a founding member, together with Italy, of the Virgo Instrument and Ego Consortium, the CNRS is really proud to have played his role in this scientific and technical enterprise. 
it is important to recognize that uh, this, you know, this kind of projects such as Virgo or LIGO are quite big. They require a lot of efforts, both human and financial, which have to be sustained over several decades. And CNS is really proud, uh, together with INFN and other institutions, of having been able to do that. Su supporting a project for <coughs> several decades is not that, that easy to do. Now today, about 20 years after the start of Virgo and a century after Einstein's prediction, these efforts are really paying off. About uh, 70 or so scientists from the CNS and French universities are co-authors of this amazing discovery, which results from a joint effort of uh, Virgo and LIGO. Now, as we've heard today, this is truly a global effort. Scientists from all over the world, in Europe and US, but also in other countries, have teamed up to come to this discovery. And as an example of global collaboration, I'd like to mention uh, something uh, quite special, which is the coating of the mirrors that are used in those interferometers. Now, both, in both you know, experiments, LIGO and VIRGO, the my, my mirrors were coated uh, by a company, which is, uh, uh, sorry, by a lab, which is a CNS lab, which is in Lyon. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> and it's crucial to have this, uh, you know, kind of uh, technical achievement to detect the um, uh, gravitational waves. Um, so, as we say, you know, sometimes we are very proud in France to, uh, to say that, uh, you know, wherever these gravitational waves are detected, they indeed went through some mirrors which were coated in Lyon, France. <laughs> Um, let me end by saying again that CNS is really proud of being part of this exceptional discovery, which we hope will be followed by many others. Thank you very much. Congratulations again to LIGO and VIGO teams for their amazing achievement. Thank you very much. Uh, and now in the pleasure for the Netherlands to invite Tan Bedfeldsen, the director of NICA. Yeah, for me, it's of course an, uh, an extreme pleasure to, to be here and I'm extremely proud uh, to witness this uh, discovery. I congratulate the LIGO and the Virgo teams by this fantastic uh, uh, discovery and uh, it really is mind-boggling what we have seen. Uh, you know, the position that, uh, that we managed, that you managed to uh, uh, achieve we compared in the Netherlands that if you look at our country, it has, it has a big lake inside. And um, if you would um, put in that lake only one drop of water, the height of the level of the lake would increase. And the measurements to, that uh, we present today uh, are only 1,000, 100,000 uh, um, um, more accurate. It's, it's amazing. So we witnessed the last moments of uh, black hole, black hole coalescence with an extreme amount of uh, energy. And of course from the Netherlands, NICAF is very proud to have joined uh, the Advanced Virgo um, uh, and we are very happy uh, to be there. I think that we are also quite visible. Um, in the Netherlands, maybe it's nice to say we have started something called the National Science Agenda, which is which is asking a general audience like, what do you think are the most fundamental questions that you like to answer, that the scientists you want uh, to answer? And um, uh, so there was an inquiry and 11,000 questions have uh, popped up and many of them are curiosity-driven science. People are really, really curiosity. What are the building blocks of matter and what are the fundamentals of space and time? And, uh, and here today, I think we uh, reached a new uh, level of answering this sort of questions, and I think that's uh, marvelous to say. Allow me to say only two sentences in Dutch. Yes. Uh, beste collega's, um, uh, deze ontdekking is echt fenomenaal. Uh, van harte gefeliciteerd iedereen die eraan mee heeft gewerkt uh, op ons instituut en uh, daarbuiten. Uh, ik wil jullie van harte feliciteren en maak er een mooi feest van. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for that time. Now, for Poland, uh, I would like to invite the Vice President of the Polish Academy of Science, uh, Paweł Nowicki, to tell us some words.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Uh, I have to say this is a wonderful day today, and uh, I am really proud that, that we are part of this uh, international group. I think it is, uh, this day is a triumph of, uh, of human mind, but also a triumph of uh, collaboration. We, we, we need to look at this as a fantastic collaboration throughout uh, many nations, throughout many uh, the research institutions all over the world. And uh, I am extremely happy that one of these groups is Polish group, which uh, has the name Polgraf, or Polish gravity. And uh, I am very happy that uh, a, a Polish scientists were uh, visionary enough to join uh, Vigro Group in 2008 and uh, it was uh, Professor Andrzej Krulak who is with us here today who was uh, the, the head of this uh, Polish group. And when I mentioned the, the strong collaboration, it was also within Poland. It was very important. It was not only uh, one, uh, one uh, research institution but a number of universities uh, which, which are spread out all over Poland and also the, the research institutes of the Polish Academy of Sciences that led the, uh, the, the consortium that was established. It was Institute of Mathematics of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Let me again mention that I am very proud that Poland was a part of this fantastic achievement. Thank you very much. Now well, for Hungary, I would like to invite uh, the director of the Wigner Research uh, Center in Physics, Peter Levi. Thank you. It is a great honor for me to stand here and representing the Hungarians and the Wigner Research Center. Uh, this is a great celebration, and uh, I would like to congratulate for the LIGO-VIRGO collaboration, because this achievement, I think, opened uh, a great window for the future, and not to close anything, just open it. Uh, congratulations for the first detection of the gravitational waves. Einstein predicted 100 years ago this, what, we, what you achieved, what we achieved, and uh, <clears throat> may I just add a little Hungarian spice for it, because 100 years ago we had a great scientist, even a small country could have great scientists, very rarely. So Baro, uh, Baro, Baro Ötvös Roland, who made, who was studied gravitation in that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, I am sure that you have heard about his pendulum, his experiment on the equivalence principle, even those papers, what you mentioned here, they cited his results. So we are very proud on him. I was educated in the Ötvös University, so Ötvös is in the blood of the Hungarians. And uh, I want to mention one thing, that generally 100 years ago, he used his pendulum first time to detect oil fields underground, so that was the birth of the geophysics and the application of the uh, gravitation in the industry. So I think now we are just at the beginning when we detected the first time the gravitational wave, and I am pretty sure that 100 years from now when our followers will sit here, so they will discuss how all of this has been uh, employed has been established in the industry. So I think we again open a great window for the future and I am very happy that we Hungarian could contribute a little bit and I can promise you that we can try to increase our collaboration. I will uh, try to motivate my colleagues also in Hungary and try to find more money and uh, both on the gravitational wave part and uh, or both of the analyses with the uh, recently established Wigner Data Center, we try to collaborate more actively to this great achievement. I congratulate once more, and I am very happy that Hungarians has been represented here on this great event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh.
Finally, I would like to invite for Italy the president of the National Institute of Nuclear Physics, Hi, I'm a fan. Thank you very much. Well, it's a somewhat uh, an important moment, an important moment for uh, a person that is first a physicist, okay? So I have no hat, I'm not an FN, I'm not American, I'm not Italian, I'm a physicist. A physicist that um, 40 years ago or something like that, uh, together with Fulvio, probably we were following lectures at, in the classes of the uh, University of Rome in Sapienza. There was a professor that uh, taught us uh, general relativity, explained the uh, Einstein theory, gravitational wave. For us, they were dreams. Dreams that, thanks to people like uh, the one you see there, the one are now in uh, Washington, the people that sit in many universities in the world. After so many years of efforts, have changed the, the dream into reality. Gravitational waves are with us, and they are with us to stay. As Fulvio said, a new era has been opened. The universe will complete its map. Not only photons, neutrinos, protons, charged particles, now gravitational waves. Until yesterday, a black hole was a, something written on a piece of paper. Nobody has seen a black hole. Everybody knows that black holes are there. What is a black hole? How do you see a black hole? You cannot take a picture because it's black on black, right? Um, now we know how to look for a black hole, how to study a black hole. I think an, an entire field of science that it's opening now. I think uh, there are uh, also lessons to learn from uh, what happened here. Not only because uh, these are 20 years of uh, 30 years of patients and searches after all LHC, LHC is the same. I mean, uh, people are committed to something they believe will be important and they go to the end, no matter what, no matter how long it takes, uh, no matter how many efforts it takes. Now, here, it's the point of uh, really having a vision. After all, looking after the X boson is something that uh, it's almost guaranteed that it's written on a piece of paper. Also, gravitational waves are. However, to get to this achievement, you need technologies that you don't know how to implement when you think to. Catherine was saying precisely what was the story. People have a vision, and they have really, they, they are so strong to change the vision into something that happens. Okay, this is the real lesson. And, and the other lesson is that it's useless that uh, you start uh, with the great idea if you not combine the right, uh, the right chemistry. Adalberto and Brie, equivalent people in, in the United States. So you have to find that the people that complementary put together the vision with their technical skill and go to the end. I think uh, no, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a, a lesson for for the entire science, and not because I daily use uh, an Apple computer uh, uh, that I want to repeat the, the words of uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, the science need to stay hungry and stay foolish. I mean, if we abandon the vision and we follow only the path that we know, we will be lost, okay? If uh, CNRS, NSF on United States, uh, Department of Energy, if CNRS and INFN in Europe wouldn't have trusted a vision uh, beyond the check of the feasibility, beyond the check of the feasibility in the moment, investing money on something that really was a dream, we wouldn't have today this discovery. I would finish in Italian, in Italian because people living in the region are the only that could really appreciate what I'm going to say. <laughs> Quando loro vi hanno detto che un, come un atomo tra qui e il Sole, no? cioè la distanza tra il Sole e la Terra è cambiata di un atomo, beh, chi c'è questo? Cioè, ma, insomma, chi se ne frega. <ride> per favore, pensate se improvvisamente all'origine, perché quell'oggetto sta 1 e 3 miliardi di anni luce là, all'origine non è un atomo tra la Terra e il Sole, sono Pisa e Livorno che si fondono insieme. <ride> Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, and now, after this very appreciated intervention of the representative of the agency, that uh, again I thank a lot for their courage to support this foolish adventure, it is time for question and answer. And I will ask to the journalists uh, here present to pose a question that uh, Fulvio will manage uh, in the audience. Potete fare delle domande in italiano, vous pouvez poser des questions en français, ou que vous fragen in het Netherland stellen. Et si vous voulez faire des questions en castellano, à qui à qui peut les contester, si vous voulez faire un deutsch sprechen, so, please ask question. Anche il Livornese deve. Please, start. Let's start. <laughs> Questions? Who is better? Go ahead. I can tell you, Microphone. Microphone. In Italian or in English? Eh? English. Uh, you were following from gravitational waves, so now you found. What will you do from tomorrow? Pia, yeah, please. <laughs> Try to reply. What will happen tomorrow? Pia Stone. Yeah. Oh, uh, I have to say that this is not the end of something, but this is the beginning. So now we know that. Uh, we can detect uh, gravitational waves. And this means uh, that uh, we can now, for example, start to investigate uh, the universe uh, with different eyes. Because gravitational waves uh, are so weak uh, that they are difficult to be detected. But uh, th this is also their beauty, because they travel uh, from the event, uh, very far event. This one was one uh, uh, billions of years uh, uh, aside, and uh, they carry the information exactly as it, it was emitted, because uh, they do not uh, uh, lose information. And this is something which is possible only using gravitational waves. So different kinds of sources, these are black holes, but we have explosion of supernova, we have a stochastic background of gravitational waves. Which, uh, we, uh, will carry, which carries the information from the Big Bang. And this is something which uh, we might want to see. Besides uh, the uh, universe, so in astrophysical and cosmological uh, information, then the result, there are also other aspects, more mathematical or physical, uh, related to uh, aspects of, of the uh, general relativity. Because uh, there are things uh, which have been predicted by Einstein, which we know are correct, but there might be some uh, modifications. With this event, we have been able to check some aspects, but there, are, there is much more to do. I would like to know something about the sources. I mean, is there any uh, astronomical observation about the, source, the sources? And uh, this, what can we say about black holes? So this looks like an independent observation of the existence of the black holes. Is it like that? Can we say something about the size of these objects? Just, just a moment, I want to inform the Italians at least that the president of uh, the Italian um, government has just phoned to me saying congratulations and he wants to details later. I told him that we were uh, discussing <laughs> about, no, that we were discussing about science, he said no problem, I'll call later. <laughs> But, I mean, it, it's an event in itself. Yeah. 
So, from the merger of uh, two black holes, of uh, stellar mass black hole, we don't expect uh, uh, electromagnetic emission. So, there is consensus of the model that we don't expect electromagnetic emission. In any case, uh, we, uh, LIGO and Virgo, signed uh, 74 a memorandum of agreement with the group of astronomers around the world. And so when uh, we, we had this uh, candidate in September, we send alert to all the observatories, and uh, 21 groups follow this event. And uh, there are uh, observatory ground-based telescopes and also uh, satellite. And uh, you will see in the next, uh, in the next week also uh, their results. Allora, eh, buonasera. Allora, il, um, abbiamo saputo che il Presidente del Consiglio si è congratulato per telefono, non sappiamo bene che cosa... Siamo molto orgogliosi. Siamo molto orgogliosi di questo. Io volevo riallacciarmi a una cosa che aveva detto il Presidente dell'INFN, ha detto la scienza ha bisogno di essere affamata. Allora, mettendo in relazione le due cose, la telefonata del Presidente del Consiglio, la necessità, parlavamo di fondi per caso e di finanziamenti. Guardi, io come dire, sono, una persona educa sono una persona educata, va bene? Cioè, non mancherò nel seguito della telefonata, quando diciamo, darò dei dettagli di questo evento, non mancherò di ricordare al Presidente che certamente diciamo, per continuare a mantenere questa capacità di, eh, di ricerca dovremo anche eh, mantenere un come dire, high maintenance, insomma, eh, abbiamo bisogno di che, che la scienza venga finanziata. Ricordo però, questo diciamo, è un problema nostro e credo che riguardi proprio mm. lei, che il Presidente Renzi diciamo, nell'ultima legge di stabilità ha comunque riconosciuto le capacità dell'Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare prevedendo uno stanziamento esplicito bene, di 45 milioni distribuiti su tre anni per l'Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare, quindi non, non l'intervento a pioggia diciamo, che, che di solito si riduce a tutta l'Italia. Quindi tutto posso dire tranne che il Presidente Renzi che è venuto in visita al CERN eh, non, non troppo tempo fa eh, diciamo, è attento evidentemente a, a, questo, a questo lavoro che stiamo facendo, insomma diciamo, non ho veramente motivo di, eh, di lamentarmi da questo punto di vista, che poi tutto il discorso sulla ricerca e sui fondi lo possiamo fare, ma forse non è il momento giusto. Qui. Eh, ci avete abituato a pensare che ci sono delle cose che si cercano e poi si trovano, no? In questi anni ci avete invitato per il bosone di X, ha funzionato, ci avete invitato per le onde gravitazionali, abbiamo festeggiato, volendo ci sono state altre cose come il buco nero, il decimo pianeta, nono, eccetera. Da, la prossima volta per che cosa ci rivedremo? Rispondo io. Dai, vai, vai. Science is done, uh, uh, is characterized by a lot of uh, uh, unsuccessful enterprise and few successful enterprise. But both are crucial because we have to explore new things. And new things means risk. We have to risk and see if our vision is correct or not. So what else? I don't know. Probably dark matter, dark energy, new physics uh, for the uh, beyond the start of model. We will see. Mm. What do you guess? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I was used to, to tell my students that uh, the things uh, have already been discovered. Now we have only difficult things to discover. So it will take time, effort, many people, several scientists, engineers, technicians, workers, administrative staff distributed in many laboratories all over the world, and also especially here at Igo, that are really extremely useful for development of science and are all contributing. Other questions?
Five or six years ago, I don't remember exactly, there, there was uh, something strange in the LIGO experiment about uh, a false positive and uh, after a blind injection of the, of the staff and there were the, an envelope was open and you discovered that it was a failed signal. Is, is it the same for this one or is it a real one? <laughs> no, the, you're right. Uh, in one of the, in, in the last two runs that we had in the initial LIGO detector era, we agreed as a collaboration jointly with Virgo that we would uh, put in uh, a blind injection. And a blind injection means that a very small number of people within the collaboration uh, are empowered to enter the signal into the data. And then what we did was an end-to-end -end proof that we could go from the instruments to detection and analysis. And then we asked ourselves, was this a blind injection? And it was. In this case, categorically, it was not a blind injection. Um, it was the first, we spent the first two months after September analyzing and reanalyzing. And as I think Fulvio mentioned in his talk, uh, the likelihood of nature producing a signal that we've been looking for for 30 years is much higher than a blind injection, which we cannot, uh, we exclude. Now, just to give you an extra information, the analysis of this one month of data, because this analysis is mainly focused on the first part of the, the data collected from LIGO, took 50 million of CPU hours. 50 million of CPU hours for analyzing the data and getting these results. So I don't know how many... Uh, I see several computer yeah. centers <laughs> working full time. Other questions? Further questions? Please, again. Ah, oh, no, please. Mi chiedevo eh, che effetto potrà avere questa scoperta sugli, sui progetti di rilevamento delle onde gravitazionali eh, nello spazio, cioè nel progetto pilota che è attualmente è su un satellite che credo si chiami El Alisa e, 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 su, a, Lisa, e su quello diciamo futuro... Eh... Credo che la migliore risposta la possa dare il professor Giovanni Trovi, che è dell'Università di Trento e quindi è il vicino di casa di, della, di, eh, del gruppo di Elisa. Pris. Bene, l'obiettivo della missione che è in corso e che entra in una fase cruciale dalla settimana prossima è una dimostrazione di potenzialità nella capacità di misura della posizione di masse di prova, eh, quindi è un dimostratore tecnologico cosiddetto e eh, è un dimostratore necessario per poter passare alla fase di progettazione della missione finale. La fase della missione finale, se venisse approvata dalle agenzie speciali in modo definitivo, dovrebbe essere prevista intorno al 2030. Allora, abbiamo un, uno scenario attualmente in cui i rivelatori basati a terra come l'Aigo Virgo a cui si unirà Kagra in Giappone e, e probabilmente Lago India, faranno osservazioni delle sorgenti che ha citato Piastone eh, nei prossimi vent'anni e poi si riuscirà ad andare verso sorgenti cosmologiche più massive come eh, misurazioni dei buchi neri che stanno al centro delle galassie, mergini di galassie e comunque informazioni di interesse cosmologico con la missione spaziale dopo il 2030 plausibilmente. Grazie Giovanni. Further questions? Uh, very short. Uh, if you had to explain to a non-physicist um, the importance of this discovery uh, for 
for the life. I mean, uh, a lot of money and a lot of people is working on it. So I think uh, uh, it's what we, we will have to do <laughs> tomorrow to explain why is it so important. <laughs> Uh, first of all, is uh, the, the first uh, the direct observation of a gravitational wave, which, uh, as uh, Fulvio said, and uh, it was said several, several times, it's uh, something very great because uh, Einstein equations are most uh, uh, verified in the solar system for wake effects. But here we have uh, we are in facing uh, very very strong gravitational fields. And this is the first time that we can observe at the same time uh, a system which is highly relativistic and <coughs> emitting gravitational waves, and that we can detect them. It's something exceptional, and it's the first uh, step to a, a new astronomy, as Fulvio explained. That's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have another kind of answer on, you, on your question. <laughs> which is the standard one when someone asked to Faraday what uh, does it mean to discover the Faraday Neumann lens law? And the answer was that the government will put a tax on it. So also <laughs> the gravitational waves probably no, will put a tax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how far are we from detecting gravitational waves coming from uh, the Big Bang and possibly from inflation. Uh, can LIGO and Virgo do that or LIGO? I, I or ask uh, uh, Professor Krolak to give you uh, an answer about that. How far we are from uh, detecting the, the stochastic background? <laughs> One billion of dollars. Well, it's ver very difficult uh, One billion to, of say, dollars? <laughs> One billion to, of dollars say, to say this, uh, but you know, the chances are increasing. After we detect the gravitational wave from uh, uh, binary black hole systems, we hope we detect other signals, and in particular from the stochastic background for, uh, from the early, early, early universe. But, you know, I really I cannot say at, at the moment these, these signals have a much less chance to be detected because we, we know much less about their likely strengths. So there is a wide range of... Uh, uh, pardon? About... Uh, frequency. Well, I mean, these stochastic signals, they have a very wide band. They have a huge band. So they are in the whole band of the detector. I have a question about the past. Um, was it difficult to convince the politics at that time to give, us, to give you money for do that kind of experiment? And Adalberto, Adalberto, please, tell us what happened. Well, I would say that it's not very difficult. It seems incredible, but um, I think that the, the fact that there were two nations, France and Italy, together for, uh, for creating this large detector, uh, actually was an argument very important for, for, for also for politicians. And um, we had many years to wait until we have been financed. Uh, we have been approved uh, officially uh, in 94, uh, after a work of something like uh, 15 years uh, of demonstrating that the things were solid and feasible. But I would say that the the government, respond, government responded very well. Also in terms of constructions, we had facilitation, facilities for uh, p public utility, which is, as you have seen, uh, this enormous building construction of six, six kilometer uh, with buildings and everything. So um, we, have, we were really very easy on, uh, on acquiring the, the grounds. Uh, and this was due to the fact that the governments were helping us very much.
Any other question? Ah, the lady. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Ecco, quando... It is not working. Okay, it's working now. I mean, someone asked before uh, why is important this discovery for our life. I mean, is it true? I mean, I would like to add something. I mean, besides science and the knowledge, which is very, very important, uh, this discovery, I think, uh, really, I mean, opening a new era, that's for science. I mean, I would like to say that uh, there is a, really a great technological development in uh, LIGO and in Virgo. I mean, uh, technological, I mean, uh, it means uh, on uh, the mechanics, electronics, optics, and, uh, you know, I mean, we, in our life, in our society, we can take advantages of, uh, I mean, many, many things. So let me just... Uh, tell you, for example, internet. I mean, uh, all of you knows that internet comes from CERN, from, uh, I mean, uh, from research. And then, uh, although even people doesn't see immediately, maybe now, these, uh, I mean, advantages of this discovery in our life, I mean, I am sure that, I mean, the only, I mean, only research, and only, I mean, big discoveries they can bring, so I'm sure, some improvement in our life. That's, there is no doubt about that. I think our, I mean, government, our, I mean, uh, minister, I mean, our first minister, I mean, is very, I mean, I'm very glad that he, the phone call that our president told us. But I think they should understand that research and innovation is the only, is the only really, I mean, way to have, I mean, social development in all sense. So I think this is a very important, I mean, point that I would like to make. Just answering, I mean, the question, what is improving in our life with this important discovery? That's what I, okay. A very, a very, a very little uh, things to, to, to what I said, uh, uh, Giovanni. I think that science is not only a question related with the economy. Science is something related also with the spirit. And if, if we know that the theory is working, and this is a very big achievement for our spirit and for our knowledge, this could be extremely important for us. What is the, uh, if someone is, uh, is asking us why uh, the music is, is, uh, is uh, why we use music? Music is, is useless or not? Science is the same. Do you know that there was uh, the famous uh, toast by Hilbert? He, his toast was uh, to mathematics that never will be applied. So let us try to, to dream in this sense. And science is the biggest dream of humanity. Question by Ci è voluto tanto tempo per raccogliere il segnale. Quanto tempo ci vorrà perché gli interferometri assumano una sensibilità tale da rendere, non dico quotidiano, ma frequente l'evento della, della raccolta dell'onda gravitazionale? Sì, The, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we measure amplitude. And unlike power from starlight, amplitude diminishes at one over the distance as opposed to one over the distance squared. So every factor of two sensitivity improvement gives us a factor of eight in the sphere that we can see. And we are now within reach of increasing the sensitivity. Well, when Virgo comes on also, at least a factor of two to three more. Factor of three is a factor of almost 30. So our rates would go 30 times more frequently with this generation of instrument. Are there other questions? C'è una dimensione comunitaria di questo esperimento che è molto interessante. 
sia all'interno di Virgo, all'interno di Lago, che nei rapporti fra Laigo e Virgo. E, è mh, veramente mh, interessante cercare di capire come sia stato possibile tenere insieme questa, questa comunità e torno a quali momenti, e torno a quali figure, e anche con quali rituali, accordi, protocolli, è perché è veramente inusuale vedere una collettività che si muove all'unisono in questo modo, anche in ambienti Certamente. che potrebbe avere Certamente. problemi. Certamente, è un caso di sociologia scientifica che nella mia esperienza, devo dire, ho trovato rara. Tra le lotto buffe, vice non data. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem, but in, in my opinion, in the, uh, in the domain of science is much more easier because we have a common language. Well, science is a common language, and this is uh, the base. And you don't make money. Eh? And you don't make, money. You don't make money. That is the point, which is dividing people. <laughs> Economy is uh, dividing people sometimes. <laughs> I, I yeah. think, anyway, that uh, I, I passed several different. Uh, Uh, environmental science. I was an astrophysicist and I moved towards particle physics and uh, gravitational wave. In my experience, this case of gravitational wave collaboration between LIGO and Virgo is really a special one. But I think we will discuss a little bit in a, 10 minutes from now out of this place. I would like to conclude with two points, uh, if you allow me. First, uh, uh, I think you have noticed that on the world there are six flags. Five are the flags of the countries that are contributing to Virgo and Vals and Virgo, and the last one is the European one. Well, uh, everybody puts the European flag because uh, it's by use to put the European flag, that's all. No, in our case, the European Commission has supported many young people through the grants that they provide to us, in particular through the Maria School of Tosca Curie actions that we got from the European Commission, so we are, we are grateful to the European Commission for that, for that support. And finally, since LIGO and Virgo has realized the dream uh, that already was done in the 80s, I would like to all of you to have a toast together with Champagne and Francia Corta outside the room and continue our interaction with journalists and scientists. Thank you very much.